Joel Klatt, Fox Sports lead college football analyst, was on the call at the Rose Bowl. USC the win. And uh, Mich- Michigan and Ohio State will be uh, his next game. And uh, he also started a, a new football podcast called the uh, Joel Klatt Show. Joel joins us on the program. Joel, the best win this weekend was turned in by who? Oh, I think it was. I think it was USC. I, I know that there were some upsets, right? So South Carolina, obviously, that's a that's a great win over Tennessee. But but when you think about USC needing something bigger on their resume, they had beaten Oregon State. People were wondering whether they could, you know, figure this out with maybe a defense that wasn't a great defense. I think that that stage for Caleb Williams, the win for Lincoln Riley, and then to set themselves up for a path towards the playoff and maybe even controlling their own destiny to the playoff. I thought that was the biggest win win of the weekend. You know, obviously I was rooting for, for Michigan and Ohio state pacing around my room. I was like, come on boys, we got to, let's get to 11 and 0. (laughs) But but I think the biggest one was, was USC. Uh, The worst win of the weekend was turned in by who? Uh, Alabama 34, nothing over Austin P. You know, and and listen, I've been critical of this, and it's not an SEC thing, and it's not even ne- necessarily a knock at Alabama. It's more about the structure of the sport that that we have allowed the the sport to be controlled by so many different people in terms of schedule making, um, schedule complex. That we have these these cupcake games in in November. Now, listen, I understand that these games are going to take place. I would just rather them take place in September. And the reason is, Dan, as you know, like once you start getting into the grind of a season, it just is difficult. You know, health becomes a factor. All these teams that struggled or lost to teams that maybe they shouldn't were struggling with their health. You know, whether it's the running back room at Ohio State or Michigan now with Blake Corum, uh, TCU was banged up. Uh, Tennessee obviously gets Hendon uh, knocked up in that game. Hendon Hooker, Hooker, which I feel awful about. It's difficult. And and also, these are 18 to 22-year-olds, and you're trying to get them to play at their best week in and week out. That's just a, a difficult standard to get these guys to try to uphold every single week. And then the last thing about it, I think, is that in a, in a sport in which we still rate, review, and reward championships based on subjective review. Mm-hmm. I think that winning against Austin P 34 nothing in November is brushed off as just like, okay, that's fine. If that was week one, we'd be like, what's wrong with Alabama? Right. So you can rest, you don't have to win great, and and you get to play that game, or even, you know, UAB for LSU, any of these type of like cupcake games. So, so that, that's a, a long-winded answer to a simple question. When does tampering start? When when do you get the, <laughs> the, the you know these coaches or intermediaries to reach out to somebody to say, hey, uh, we're going to need a quarterback at Tennessee next year, or yeah. you know how this goes. When when does that start? It's an interesting way you phrased it because in my mind, the first thing that I think of is. For it to start, that means that it stops at some point. <laughs> you know, right? Well, so, well, there's not a, a portal window that you go from this to this because it feels like things have to lead up to the transfer portal. Yes, and and so the, the portal, there are some more guidelines now, right? Like this year, it's a little different. You can't just enter the portal at any point. And so December 4th, I believe, is the date or 5th, maybe it it is where the por- the portal opens and so there's this thought that it's like well there's going to be no tampering until the you know until the portal is open and then it's legal because mm-hmm. then you can contact and recruit these kids i think if if we if we believe that then then we all should be you know buying up the oceanfront property outside of flagstaff right because then we're all gullible <laughs> tampering is happening inducements are happening um and and i th- I think that it is the worst unintended consequence of what were well-intended new changes to the rules. I think that the transfer rule is well-intended. It's been obviously you know, misused at times. NIL, I've been arguing for NIL for a long time since I was a player. Um, by the way, I, I played with Jeremy Bloom at Colorado, you know, so I had played minor league baseball. I could go back and I was fine. I was eligible, but he couldn't be a skier, yeah. which was, you know, it was 
it was crazy. So I've been arguing for NIL for, for a long time. But Dan, when you mix all of this together, then you've got what the landscape that we currently have where there's a lot of tampering, there's inducements, there, there's all these things, and there's rules on the books that are supposed to curtail this type of behavior. Let me just pose a, a, like a question back. I would say, isn't it more about enforcement, right? And and the governing bodies actually going out and enforcing the rules that are existing. And, and I think that that's an important piece of what college football should be moving forward. And it can't be in retrospect. Hey, two years ago, you had you know X, Y, and Z violation. I'm talking about in real time. Do you know why the NFL is the NFL? And some people love this about it. Some people hate it. They have real-time enforcement. You don't wear your socks high enough, bam, it comes out of your game check. And, and I believe that the coaches in college football are now making enough money, <laughs> right, that we should be finding coaches. It's not about vacating wins or doing something like a show cause. You tamper with a player, it's a million bucks right now. And now I'll show you a bunch of coaches that will govern themselves. And so I think that if we just – shift the way we talk about enforcement of the existing rules, I think that we could get some of this stuff under wraps. He's Joe Klatt. He'll be on the call for Michigan and Ohio State, and uh, he started a new podcast. It's called the uh, Joel Klatt Show. Let's look at the scenarios. Let's say Ohio State would lose to Michigan. Hmm. Close game. Ohio State's still a top four team after that. I, yeah, I think I think that they would be. Um, I think at that point that the the two biggest issues that that Ohio State would have, or, or I would actually say pluses for them, is that Notre Dame is on this great late season run. Penn State, uh, after the two losses to Michigan and Ohio State, have has been terrific. So all of a sudden, their resume looks really good. Okay, um, and with Tennessee losing. I think that they would still be a top four team if Ohio State were to lose. I think Michigan's a different discussion. If Michigan loses close game. I think it's going to be tough. I think that you're going to have to. I think Michigan would need some help. I think that they would. Dan, they would probably need USC to lose uh, at some point, and they would need TCU to lose. And it would help them if TCU lost actually in the championship game. So rather than like, let's say TCU lost this week, but still won the Big 12. That would because the committee is supposed to honor conference championships. So they would need, I think, a loss from USC or TCU in their conference championship game. And then you can start to make an argument. And then that argument becomes more focused towards Clemson and, and less the other two. And I think that's an, an argument that you could look favorably on the Wolverines. There is a, a, a scenario and a path, and particularly in the close game you're talking about, where 10 were to get uh, potentially two teams this year. Where is Deion Sanders coaching next year? That's a that's a great question. I've heard a lot of rumors about a lot of different places. I, I know Deion is happy where he's at. He's obviously built something very special. They're going to play for their conference championship game. Um, I think if if I had to bet, I would say he stays where he's at, Dan. If I had to put money down, and and I thought I I had said earlier in the year that I thought it was going to be Auburn. Uh, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. It won't – listen, it, it won't surprise me at all if he takes a job or someone makes a run at him here late. But I do know uh, those close to him have said he is laser-focused on the season that he's having, and in particular this championship run that he's going to be having that will finish on December 3rd. Yeah, I wonder – you don't take a job to take a job. You take the right job for you, and he seems very calculated if I am leaving – I want to make sure that I'm successful, not go yeah. into Nebraska where, you know, that might take a while. Uh, Auburn, you know, jumping into the SEC. You know, I know that previous year that he interviewed for a few jobs and yeah. and didn't get those and then didn't even get his alma mater, Florida State. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing that if he, if he stays, it's because he doesn't see the correct, uh, right opportunity for him now, but that doesn't mean he's going to stay at Jackson State, you know, for a long period of time. Yeah, and it it doesn't it seem like and I was I, Saturday night I was I was <laughs> I was explaining the Spider-Man meme to Gus. I don't know if you caught that. And he was like, "Well, what does that mean?" And I was like, "I I don't even know. It's just a bunch of Spider-Mans pointing at each other." Like I you know, <laughs> but 
It does feel a little <laughs> bit like that amongst Power Five schools right now. Like everyone's just staring at each other, thinking to themselves, Who, who's going to do it? You know, who's going to pull the trigger? He's going to be a Power Five coach at some point. I firmly believe that. And he's proved his acumen as a head coach. This is not a novelty bit. You know, Dan's a really good coach. That team is a very good team. He's a he's an excellent recruiter. Um, he's a great leader. You, know, you talk to people around Jackson State, and the things that he does away from the cameras uh, are are really good and strong, and have a foundation. So he's going to be a head coach. I, I firmly believe that. And I also think it's interesting the way that he views the coming landscape of an expanded playoff. Um, you know, I've been talking with a lot of people within the sport, and they've been talking about. You know, I think that jobs even outside of the Big Ten and SEC, while they might not have the 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 revenue share that the Big Ten and SEC has, there could be an easier path to the playoff as it expands. So I think that the, the way that we view jobs might be a little behind right now. And and as it relates to, I think that'll be an interesting piece to this of what, what he views the, the coming landscape of the sport to be and where he thinks he can have top end success. Jimbo Fisher safe. <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Listen, if I'm signing checks, yes, because that's not, <laughs> that's, that's not a check I'm willing to sign. He, he, I don't know. I, I, I got to be honest, like I would have said all year, Dan, that like, yeah, they're, they're not going to do that. They can't do that. But it's gotten to a level now where the toxicity within the program um, is, you know, is so bad now. Is it so bad that it's $85 million? I'm not sure. And Jimbo's got all, all the leverage there. I will say this about Jimbo. He just hasn't adjusted. Think about the great coaches, even in the last decade. They've adjusted at some point in their career, right? Like Nick Saban is winning a very different style and using a different offense, and he's adjusted from what he was uh, when he first got to Alabama. Ed Ogeron did that with Joe Brady and brought in Joe Burrow. Bob Stoops did that when he hired Lincoln Riley. Uh, Urban Meyer did that when he brought in Ryan Day. Uh, Mike Bellotti did that back at Oregon when he brought in Chip Kelly. We, we see this time and time again where guys adjust, and we haven't seen that from Jimbo Fisher. That's what he needs to do. His his staff is going to need to change drastically. And then this is also a case study, Dan. And like, is it is it good for your team, your locker room, to just go out there and and do what we all suspect happened at Texas A and M? Yes, you get a number one recruiting class, but did they come for the promises or did they come for the place? And and th that's a question now. You've got a lot of coaches that are sitting there and they're, they're thinking to themselves, do I really want to commit NIL dollars to guys that have never been in my locker room yet? Because the case study at Texas A&M is, is pretty stark in terms of it didn't work this year. If a player leaves, do I still have to pay him? How, how does NIL work if – is it a year-to-year -year contract like a scholarship is? Well, there there is no rhyme or reason. There's no singular, you know, stock form. We're not pulling this out of the shelf and saying like, hey, here's the NIL thing like it used to be with a scholarship, right? A letter of intent. So every one of these is different. I've seen NILs that are very straightforward. If you're here, if you're eligible, you know, this is, this is what the NIL uh, contract states. I've seen them come from companies and I've seen them facilitated through the university. Uh, I've also seen third party agents get involved and start promising kids things that are outside of the school or outside of any entity that's paying money saying like, hey, I'm, I'm going to promise you I'm going to go get these deals. And then in the fine print, I've seen this and this is where it's very sad. These players are signing away future earnings. You and I both know that that happens in the NFL going towards the draft, but now it's starting to happen in college football. I don't think that that's great for, for these athletes or their families. So to answer your question, like th there's no one way that this is being done, which is why people are so eager to try to get, let's say, federal legislation to try to put some sort of guardrails around what we're doing right now in, in name, image, and likeness. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I liked Caleb Williams for the Heisman because mm. I saw how this was going to play out, or at least I thought it was. He was going to be playing ranked teams. You, you know, you, you got uh, UCLA, then you have Notre Dame, and you have the Pac-12 title game. Those are all standalone games. Yeah. And C.J. Stroud was going to have the Michigan game. The Iowa game and the Big Ten title game is 
probably not going to mean as much. But <laughs> but Caleb Williams has games that are Notre Dame is big, the Pac-12, uh, you know, uh, title game, and then what happened against UCLA. We're running out of Heisman candidates here, Joel. Yeah. I mean, we got we C.J. Are. Stroud and Caleb Williams, and, I mean, Blake Corum got injured. So uh, I don't know. Uh, Hooker got injured. I don't know. Are we going to have three guys, four guys go to New York here? How do you see this? I'm not out? sure. Yeah. And and by, by the way, Drake May, who had some late run, you know, they lose and he doesn't throw a touchdown and, and, and throws a pick in that game. I think Max Duggan is is maybe kind of in there and has a shot to get to New York because yeah. of how he played uh, against Baylor last week. But you're exactly right. I've always said that that we always argue about like, is it most valuable player? Is it most outstanding? Should it be a guy that's on a, a worse team? Listen, the reality of the Heisman is it kind of fits in three categories. You got to be a great player on a great team, and then you have to have what you're talking about, which is those moments on the stages necessary late in the season to get everybody's attention. And and this is one of the reasons why Derrick Henry wins the Heisman of McCaffrey, right? McCaffrey didn't really have those moments and stages late in the season like Derrick Henry did uh, when he was going off in November in that great um, uh, year. So to your point, I, if you look at the betting markets, C.J. Stroud is is right there as the favorite, as the Heisman favorite. And then before last week, Caleb Williams was fifth. Now he's second and a pretty clear second. And it's really just those two. And so you're looking at a situation where I believe that the next 60 minutes of football for each of these players is going to determine the Heisman Trophy. So you've got Stroud against Michigan and what will be an epic game with, shoot, I mean, at least we're hoping close to 20 million people watching these two undefeateds. And you've got the Notre Dame SC rivalry with Caleb Williams. There's not a doubt in my mind that Caleb is more valuable to his team than maybe even C.J. Stroud. And that's not a knock against Stroud. It's just kind of an, an ode to what the roster is for USC. After last week, I can tell you right now that Caleb Williams is, is transforming to this incredible talent to a guy that reminds me a lot of, of a little like a Mahomes-esque quality. When he breaks contain, he's such a threat throwing the ball on the run. He's such a threat keeping his eyes downfield, willing to make any throw, and then does it with accuracy. Um, you know, he's going to be hard to beat. I think even for CJ Stroud, if he goes mm. out there and they beat Notre Dame and he throws for like 350 or 400 yards, and this is a Notre Dame defense, by the way, pass defense that is not bad. Eight interceptions and only five touchdowns given up in the last uh, four games and haven't had a 300-yard passer. Oh, actually, only one this year, and it was Drake May from North Carolina. I'll, I'll leave you with this thought on Drake May in the final 30 seconds. Open market. If, if, there were, if he was on the open market right now, mm. just like Caleb Williams was, what is Drake May worth? <laughs> For one year? Yeah, you can bring him in. I mean, he's a redshirt freshman. You might get him for two. 10, 15, right? I mean, like, because if it works, a year? then it's worth every penny. But yeah. I mean, think think about what, what a playoff run means to, to a team, to that conference in terms of revenue share. But let's say so, Tennessee, they just lost Hooker. I don't know what their backup situation is. But if Drake May <laughs> wanted to go to Tennessee, open market, pay him $10 million a year? I mean, we, we, we saw it. So Tennessee reportedly... Offered now it was over four years, but it was a somewhere between eight and nine million dollars to a kid coming out of high school that's yeah. going to sign and go there. So if you're telling me I can get a a a known commodity yeah. like Drake May, I think that that would be worth close to ten. Yeah. <laughs> and by the, by the way, and I'm not saying that I don't like their backups, but if I'm Drake May, and I hate just I hate throwing this out there, but real quick, Dan, if I'm one of those great quarterbacks, like Drake May, I'm looking at Marvin Harrison and being like, oh wait, he doesn't have a starter coming back. Because that dude, Marvin Harrison Jr., he's one of the best players I've ever covered in college football. Drake May to Ohio State. <laughs> $10 million. Hey, you know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, have fun this weekend. And, Thank you. Uh, tell Gus we said hello. Thank you, bud. I will. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. That's Joel Klatt, Fox uh, College Football Analyst, their lead analyst who has Michigan and Ohio State.